part of the Constitution and its provisions on social justice and human rights with the poor as a center of our development. Number two, never again to any authoritarianism. Number three, the economy must be firmly and safely placed in the hands of Filipinos themselves. Unlike the U.S. Constitution, our Constitution gives equal primacy of social and economic rights to civil and political rights because we are a country of inequalities for generations where the starting positions of the rich and the poor are not equal. Social justice is about the adjustment of these starting positions through education and health and four asset reform programs, agrarian reform, fisheries reform, uh, <clears throat> urban land reform and housing and ancestral domain, where the poorest of the poor are. All of these problems are underperforming either by non-enactment of reform law, underfunding of the programs, or by loopholes in the law by the legislative. Our constitution is not perfect. No constitution is perfect because it's written by imperfect people. But before its writings, we conducted consultations all over the country and the people overwhelmingly preferred the stability of familiar structures a democratic and representative presidential system, checks and balances, separation of powers and the rule of law. And they overwhelmingly wanted to power to directly elect their president. This is the constitution that certain people want to change. I submit your honors that we have failed or underperformed in addressing the underdevelopment of outlying areas from Manila, Second, the problem of mass poverty and gross inequalities. And third, the weakening of our institutions, not because of the Constitution, but because we have either ignored its mandates or not fully implemented them, especially on social justice and local autonomy. The Constitution, Your Honors, is not the problem. It is part of the solution. On the content. Attached bills, resolutions, and petition of Kapatiran that proposed charter changes uh, <clears throat> being considered by the committee. On the form and system of government, experts on constitutional institutional design literature, like Professor Jean Laxa of UP Political Science and others, reason against a shift to federalism. I will only mention four. Countries with functioning democratic systems, however imperfect, should consider reform and refinements and only of manifest errors rather than an overhaul because there is no consensus on the superiority of a federal to uniform of government and vice versa. Why shift? This was also the advice of the Global Forum on Autonomy and Governance held at the Ducit Hotel in the Philippines, October 20 to 22, 2016 with some 50 foreign experts and, diplomat, experts and diplomats. Number two, a messed up structural overhaul is virtually irreversible and could lead to an unstable democracy or even its ruin. Number three, a precondition for a successful shift to federalism is a fully functioning political party system that we do not have. And number four, federalism tends to serve the interest of and thus further entrenches the existing dominant groups in the regions. In our case, political dynasties, warlords, and the landed elite, who will likely find the regional powers and resources of federalism to their liking. The shift to federalism adds regional governance, which is not even consistent with the principle of subsidiarity. And it involves a transition period which according to former UP President Abueba could take 10 years, during which time the president would have authoritarian powers per the transitory provisions of the Puno Consultative Committee. Acknowledged fiscal experts like Professor Rosario Manasan, former finance and USEC Bilvinda Gavara, have constructive insights on the amendments to the local government code and other laws and reforms to devolve real powers to administratively capable LGUs. Manasan without any need of federalization. Manasan cites three national consultations in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao conducted in 2014 and 2015 that resulted in a consensus on some 30 amendments 
to the fiscal provisions of the local government code, including the increase of the internal revenue allotment. Has Congress acted on these proposals? The Supreme Court has already addressed the resource problem with the Bandana's ruling, such that the problem now is the need to improve the local government capacity to fully absorb it without amending the Constitution. On, on the change in appointment of justices to the Supreme Court, I don't think it makes a difference whether the appointment is made by the president from the recommendations of the Judicial and Bar Council or by, Supreme, by the Supreme Court itself from three recommendations of the president for every vacancy. On the proposal for a tandem vote for president and vice president in a provision for runoff elections, I'm, I think I'm open to that, but not at this time as explained later. Minor amendments may just be Trojan horses to a broader agenda because once convened, the convention or constituent assembly has plenary powers that cannot be limited by law. On the insertion of quote, unless otherwise provided by law, in nine economic provisions, including education, I will leave that to the session this afternoon and I will only comment on the insertion of the phrase, unless otherwise provided by law. It is a dangerous proposal because it's wholesale transfer of power from the Constitution to the Congress on foreign ownership. Once inserted, the constitutional provisions become meaningless and the door is opened wider to transactional legislation at which corrupt politicians and greedy business are very adept. The insertion is insidious because it is made to appear as harmless since it only gives Congress flexibility to determine the actual percentages at the appropriate time. But the change is made only by ordinary law with much lesser House and Senate votes and without need of a vote of the people themselves in a plebiscite. Incidentally, the power of Congress works both ways, up or down. It's an instability of the rules a deterrent rather than an incentive to investors. On land, there is an important dimension to land in our culture because of the history of colonization and historical injustices. Land is not just an economic commodity. To, to our people and to the poor, it is a social asset because it embodies their emancipation into mainstream society. Even the foreign chambers of commerce admitted that lifting land restrictions may raise land prices beyond the reach of the poor. So those who argue for foreign ownership rights because they say it cannot be brought out of the country just don't get it. Beware of the wrath of the people if the proposal is approved. On the process, the process of charter change being considered is a constitutional convention and the people are assured that the delegates should be independent and competent because they will be selected by the people themselves by congressional districts. Moreover, incumbent officials are disqualified as delegates and political parties cannot participate in the, in the elections. And it's being rushed now to, um, to quote, counteract any suspicion of vested interest or for personal ambitions. With all due respect, your honors, the fact is that political dynasties now control Congress and electing the delegates by district will only result in a mirror image of the composition of the Congress with the same control of outcomes by the dynasties. It is a reality we cannot deny. And whether done in 2024 or 2028, the test of the real purpose of the amendment is its content and not its timing. Clearly. It is not the process, is, this is a process or situation we cannot trust for charter change at this time. In conclusion, your honors, last January 20, 2023, the NEDA board chaired by the president released the 480 pages of the Philippine Development Plan for 2023 to 2028 with a roadmap to improve the investment climate towards sustained and inclusive growth. It declared that the country, quote, open for business, citing the relevant laws and policies. In the plan, there is a legislative agenda for each objective. Please note 
that there is not a single reference or mention of any amendment or revision of the Constitution as a means to achieve any of the objectives. The previous Duterte administration did not also have charter change in its development plan 2017 to 2022, or in Ambition 2040. But he still appointed a consultative committee which, which proposed a total overhaul of the Constitution. He endorsed it in 2018, but backed off in 2019 when his NEDA and the Department of Finance raised objections to federalism, and I quote, because it's a risky, intricate political experiment that is vulnerable to unintended consequences, unquote. He also proposed, Duterte proposed, a revolutionary government to replace himself, which was shut down by the military in 2017 as beyond the constitution. Then he explored a vice presidential bid. Before Duterte, the six attempts at charter change were perceived to serve the self-interest of their proponents and did not prosper. Two were struck down by the Supreme Court. Duterte was two-faced about charter change and put us on the slippery slope of authoritarianism. The question begs to be asked, is the present administration as two-faced against charter change and authoritarianism as the Duterte administration? And also, Your Honors, an appeal. Please successfully implement the Philippine Development Plan, unlike the Duterte administration with its plan. And finally, your honors, please take up the challenge of dismantling the feudalistic system. It is a challenge of statesmanship to a true servant of the people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Monsodia, for giving your views on the need and then the specific issues and possible amendments. Thank you very much. And again, let me now acknowledge again, uh, Mom, Winnie, Monsod, for your presence. You know, during your program before, I had the most difficult time answering your questions. So I will not ever forget uh, those times. So anyway, we cannot proceed. And so, uh, yes, uh, let me announce that for those who wish, our members, honorable members, who wish to uh, interpolate uh, all of our resource persons after they all finish, uh, we are listing it now. The first on the list is uh, uh, Deputy Majority Leader Palma and the representative Manuel. So kindly come here and uh, have yourself listed. You will be given uh, five minutes or more. Thank you. So let us now proceed to uh, the Honorable former Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, my fellow Mindanao non. We have here Justice Adolf Ascuna, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the Republic of the Philippines. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Honorable Chairman and members of the committee, uh, and distinguished uh, panelists, my uh, friends, good morning. First, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank the committee for inviting us to this uh, very important uh, forum. And uh, I would like to agree with my uh, two colleagues uh, so far. Uh, but uh, I'd like to focus on Article 17, which is critical to any possible uh, uh, choices, whether you want to uh, call for a constitutional convention or propose specific amendments, you have to wrestle with the interpretation of Article 17, because any proposal to amend or revise the constitution must uh, be done through Article 17. I agree with uh, Justice Mendoza that this is uh, perhaps the most important provision of our present constitution. Constitution is divided into three parts. Constitution of Liberty, which is the Bill of Rights. Constitution of Governance, which is the three departments structure of government. And what is not very well known is the constitution of sovereignty. And that is the provision that spells out how to amend the constitution. Why is it called the constitution of sovereignty? 
because the power to amend the constitution is the highest act of sovereignty. Sovereignty is the power to make laws and the power to change the fundamental law is the highest power. So it is repose, Article 17. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, there is a unintended vagueness in the provision as it now exists due to the fact that the Constitutional Commission first proposed a unicameral uh, legislature called National Assembly by a vote, uh, by a majority of one vote in the committee the uh, draft that was submitted to the floor was one of a unicameral legislature. Upon voting, however, on that draft, the plenary of the Constitutional Commission voted it down by one vote. So as the vice chair of the legislative committee of the CONCOM, I was tasked by the chair, who was Honorable Lario Davide, and the president of the CONCOM, Cecilia Munoz Pama to rewrite our draft article six to fit it into a bicameral legislature. So I sat down and in a space of three hours, I redrafted our proposal into a bicameral. However, Mr. Chairman, I could not touch the provision on how to amend the constitution because that belonged to another committee. And that was chaired by the honorable sensing Suarez. So I left it untouched. I only touched Article 6. It is amending process is not there. That is the history of why Article 17 remained worded as it is because it was drafted, uh, designed to be a provision for a unicameral legislative body. And uh, therefore it needs, it's a big, but it's not without remedy because the Supreme Court can interpret uh, whether or not uh, a particular proposed amendment or revision done by Congress and through a voting chosen by Congress satisfies the uh, Article 17. So there is a need for Congress to attempt to attempt a proposed amendment or revision and submit it uh, to a plebiscite and for someone to question it in the Supreme Court so that the Supreme Court will have the opportunity to finally interpret Article 17. For example, one way of interpreting Article 17 is that Article 17 says that Proposals of men who revise the constitution may be made by Congress upon a vote of three fourths of all its members. You go to Article 6 and find out who are the members of Congress. Congress shall be composed of Senate and the House. Those are the members, not the individual senators or representatives, but Senate. It's just there. Article 6, you una. Una una article. The legislative power shall be vested in the Congress of the Philippines, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives, except for reserved people, where the power to the extent reserved to the people by initiative or referendum. So a Senate and a House, these are the members of Congress. Okay. So when you say by the vote of three fourths of all the members, three fourths of the Senate and three fourths of the House. So that's one interpretation and the Supreme Court can say that. So I propose that whatever you, amendments you have in mind, you adopt it by a vote of three fourths of the House, three fourths of the Senate, uh, you can vote separately. It doesn't have to be uh, jointly. As, as long as there is three fourths of the House, report to the Senate, propose it, and uh, attempt a plebiscite. Someone will stop it, bring it to the Supreme Court, and uh, we will have an interpretation. So that is uh, one way, and that is my proposal. You have to clarify Article 17. 
you have to try and attempt a proposal that will go to the Supreme Court. And uh, the next question is uh, what particular proposal can you try as a test? I would suggest the economic restrictions, removal of the economic restrictions in the present constitution. Our present constitution contains very specific economic provisions. Economic policy, however, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee are not meant to be long lasting. They are meant to be adjustable to the needs of the times. And therefore it is not uh, wise to preserve them for a long time in a fundamental law. And our constitution has been 36 years old, unamended. And these economic provisions may no longer be uh, attuned to the demands of uh, economic uh, policy today. Today we have a, a strong current of de-globalization. And uh, we have to respond to that. How do we respond to this? And uh, our provisions in the constitution may tie our hands. Uh, if there is a, for instance, an ASEAN attempt to form a common market, we cannot because our constitution forbids us from allowing foreigners to enter into certain areas of investment. We need foreign investment in order to recover from the twin impact of inflation and the pandemic. And yet we are constrained by economic policies that are not meant to last 36 years. So you can attempt. I would propose just one single amendment to remove the economic restrictions uh, in the constitution. And uh, perhaps you can just concentrate on, let's say mass media or uh, uh, education and uh, maybe public utilities uh, first. And then attempt, adopt it by a majority vote of the House of Representatives and three fourths vote of half and three fourths vote of the Senate, and then uh, submit it uh, for a plebiscite and let the Supreme Court interpret whether that is sufficient to comply with Article 17. The uh, <clears throat> proposal, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, was made initially by me. I proposed it to former Speaker Belmonte, and he took it up with uh, Senate President and really, and they both agreed. And it was uh, reduced into House res oh, both uh, joint resolution number one to amend the constitution by removing the economic restriction, restrictive economic provisions by simply adding the words, unless otherwise provided by law in key places in those economic restrictions. For instance, mass media shall be owned by 60% Filipino citizens, insert as an amendment unless otherwise provided by law. So what does that mean? It becomes changeable by legislation. So it's flexible. It's still there unless there's legislation to the contrary. But now you can, you can change it by legislation provided it is adopted by the people. It's not enough that you propose it as an amendment. It has to be submitted to plebiscite, plebiscite and the people uh, in that plebiscite has to approve it as an amendment to the constitution. So it's already approved by the people. The people empowers Congress to provide otherwise. Is that bad? No, because that's just economic policy and economic policy should be flexible. It should not have been there in the first place. So that is uh, my proposal, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, try it. Maybe it will uh, succeed, maybe not. If not, then we fall under uh, uh, Chris Monson's uh, uh, paradigm, which is to try the present constitution because it is a good constitution, but not completely implemented. The heart of the present constitution is social justice. Our problem is inequality. Poverty of alleviation, it can be remedied right now without changing the constitution by implementing the heart of the present constitution, which is 
social justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as former Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Adolf Ascuna, thank you for your views on uh, the need to amend the Constitution and especially Article 17 uh, on revision or amendment. And then uh, let me just now recognize the Honorable um, my compadre, Congressman Vice Chairperson Roy Loyola. So uh, we continue with our uh, our uh, resource persons. I'll now call on the chairperson of the National Union of People's Lawyers, our former colleague in the House of Representatives, Attorney Mary Javier Colmenares. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for inviting me to our colleagues uh, in the House and the members of the committee, well, former colleagues in the House. Uh, maraming salamat po sa pag at uh, alam nyo, alam nyo naman siguro sa mahaba na nating debate dito sa Charter Change uh, ang position ko, pero ang mga kaibigan ko at mga uh, dating kasama sa Kongreso, pinagbigyan din kami, ako, ng chance na ma masabi yung aming damdamin dito and i really appreciate that no uh, hopefully our insights can inform the committee decision on uh, this very important issue i have a slide mr chair may i ask for the secretary technical staff can we uh, yes yeah so the slides there yes let's go to the next uh, slide please so uh ang, bago ako pumunta doon sa next slide sa slide ko on is there a need no papakilabas na lang ang gusto ko lang ilabas ang opinion ko na walang fourth mode sa constitution ang constitution only allows for three modes at ang fourth mode wherein ang pagpropose ng amendment sa sa constitution ay through a process na similar sa paggawa ng batas beyond yan sa constitutional provision and for me that is a violation of the constitution so uh you know, ang, ang power ng Congress to propose amendments is a constituent as a constituent assembly is a constitutional is a power not distinct from legislative power. Hindi mo siya pwedeng imix. Na for example, the Justice Committee will convene. Sorry, the Committee on Constitutional Amendments will convene, discuss proposals to amend the Constitution. Mamaya may bill on a specific issue na hindi naman re revert sa legislative function. Tapos mamaya may bill on the proposed Constitution re revert na naman siya sa Constituent Assembly. Cannot be. I don't think a certain House can con us alone. Para sa akin, there is a need for a joint resolution. Uh, both approved by the Senate and the House to convene precisely the Constituent Assembly. When we say Assembly, Mr. Chair, Your Honours, please, when we say Assembly, it is to congregate together. It is not Constituent Assemblies of two or three bodies, Mr. Chair. So that is my, my, my point. So paano yan? If it's in the process, just like passing a law, the what if there is a discrepancy on the version of the Senate and the House? Do we have a bicameral committee meeting just like how we pass a law? I don't think so, Mr. Chair, because that is not allowed in the Constitution that such power, such body will uh, propose amendments. Paano yan? Do we need the signature of the president? But the Constitution says the president has no business in the Constituent Assembly. Can the president veto the bills passed by Congress na parang batas lang? I don't think so, Mr. Chair. So itong sinusunod nating track sa procedurally para sa akin, Mr. Chair, is not in consonance with the Constitution. There has to be a joint resolution convening both houses of Congress if we want to for us to tackle proposed amendments. Now, the second is the unless otherwise provided by law with the other resource persons, Justice Vivi Mendoza and Chairman Chris mentioned. For me, Mr. Chair, uh, that is a very dangerous provision because it grants Congress too much power to amend the Constitution. Hindi siya innocuous eh. Too much power to amend the Constitution without the need for a three-fourths vote. 
as required by the Constitution. Aamienda tayo ng Constitution through a law, walang three-fourths vote, walang plebiscite, walang people's ratification. So, Mr. Chair, para sa akin, that is actually granting Congress the power to otherwise the Constitution. And there is no, no way that a legislative body can always say otherwise to the Constitution by mere uh, statute. So yun, yun po ang punto ko dito na dapat sundin niya. Otherwise, Mr. Chair, ang batas, babago-bago, 60-40, 70-30 next year, 80-20, 100% next year, hindi natin maset ang economic direction ng, ng, ano, ng ating bansa. Lilipat-lipat yan, depending on the lobbying, depending on the business interest, lobbying daw. Too powerful ang batas, Mr. Chair. Ay yung kongreso under that, Mr. Chair. So, uh, yun lang ang points ko dyan before I go to the next question. Next slide, please. Which is, is there a need for uh, uh, cha-cha today? Para sa akin, Mr. Chair, can you please? Para siya, ang position ko... I'm sure alam naman ng mga kasamaan ko dati dito. No, there is no need for cha-cha today. Because the problems of poverty, corruption, social justice, lahat yan did not come from the Constitution. Kung, kung hindi yan nagmula sa Constitution, halimbawa, Mr. Chair, kung resolbahin natin ang corruption, resolbahin natin ang poverty, security of tenure, genuine agrarian reform, pag ma-resolve natin yan, Mr. Chair, di-develop tayo, we don't even need the cha-cha. Pero pag hindi natin yan ma-resolve, Mr. Chair, ang corruption, landlessness, yung uh, lack of security of tenure, and many other problems, ang social justice, walang mangyayaring pag-unlad sa atin, Mr. Chair, kahit mag-cha-cha tayo sampung beses sa isang taon. That is my 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 opinion there. So, uh, ano ba ang mga dangerous proposals, Mr. Chair? Para sa akin, yung taking out or endangering the national uh, patrimony provisions, protecting the Filipinos, para sa akin, nagdi-disagree akong buksan yan ngayon, lalot lalo na ang hina pa talaga ng ating national uh, industry, ng ating mamamayan, tsaka eh, siyempre yung issue ng rule of law. Ang pangalawa, magdi-disagree ako sa ilang kaibigan ko dito na yung term extensions. Alam naman natin yan. Next slide, please. So, term extensions on the ground that current terms are too short. So, sa akin, dapat yung three years ng, ng natin sa Kong at sa LGUs, i-extend to five years kasi hindi kayang tapusin ang trabaho uh, kung, kasi ang daming trabaho ng Congress. There are four, para sa akin, four powers of Congress, legislation, investigation in aid of legislation, oversight functions, at pang-apat, I call them special constitutional powers. Na hindi naman yan normal na ginagawa ng Kongreso. Uh, ano yan? Impeachment, declaration of war, and of course, con us. So, ngayon, ang, ang, ang una kong masabi dyan, actually, sana kaya yun natin in three years eh. Pag-focusan natin yan. Kaya nag mang basis nga ma question ngayon eh kulang na pala tayo ng oras para gawin ang mga trabaho ito in three years magkukon as pa tayo hindi ba natin dinadagdagan yung ating trabaho lalo so hindi siya pasok doon sa sa argument eh and pangalawa when is a term too short i mean too short ba ang term na three years so what about four or five somebody may say it's too short also Diba? Ang, ang mga kongresista ng US, two years ang term. Diba? For them to achieve the nine years, diba? kailangan nilang manalo sa, sa, sa limang re-election. Ang Australia, New Zealand, three years lang naman ang term ng kanilang parliament. So, ibig ko lang sabihin, Mr. Chair, depende yan, Mr. Chair. Eh. At maayos naman yung kongresista ng US, maayos naman yung kongresista ng New Zealand, Australia, etc. At iba pang bansa. Kahit mas maiksi yung kanilang term. So, yun lang po ang comment ko dyan sa term extension. Natin, hindi ganun klaro ang basis, lalo't lalo na may mga example naman ng ibang bansa na gagawa ito without the need for term extension. Next slide, please. President's term is too short to implement policies. So, maiksi ito, maraming mga policies uh, na hindi mapatupad ng presidente kasi kulang. So, ang ang tanong, kulang pala ang term niya, bakit i natin? Six years ngayon yan, ang proposal natin po 
ay five years. So, ba't pa natin pinaiksi lalo? Ah, kasi allowed siya for re-election to implement his policies. Eh, kung manalo siya. Diba? We're not talking of the possibilities of re-election. When we set a term for a certain public official to eh, conduct or implement policies, it's not on the on, on the ground na marire-elect naman ako, doon ko na lang tapusin yan. Y- yun lang, ang, yun lang ang, ang point ko, Mr. Chair, na kung maiksi pala siya, lalo pang pinaiksi natin from six years to five years. And what is too short? I mean, uh, ang presidente ng Amerika ay four years lang naman ang term niya, pero so far, nakita ko yung mga policies na gusto nilang implement, nagawa naman nila in four years' time. I mean, Brazil and many other countries, four years then. So, yun ang reason ko, Mr. Chair, para sa pagtingin ko na hindi hindi needed yung mga ganong klaseng revision ng term extension sa ngayon. A note ko lang dyan sa mga bills, uh, si President Marcos is not, hindi siya, hindi siya qualified to, to use the, kasi from six years ngayon, pag allowed ng five years, two terms, magiging ten years. So from six years ang presidente, magiging ten years. Ang nakalagay sa mga bills na hindi na siya pwedeng tumakbo doon to benefit from the 10 year. Ang napansin ko lang, ang magbe-benefit yung Vice President, Sara Duterte. So disqualified si President Marcos, but Sara Duterte is qualified now to have 10 years. Parang na-notice ko lang yon. Bakit hindi silang dalawa ang disqualified? Bakit beneficiary si Vice President Duterte? at hindi hindi at wala siyang similar disqualification than the current president next slide please so uh, then i looked at the way the elections will be held if this cha cha is approved 2025 may election lahat ng lgus kong at senator kasi yun naman nakalagay diyan 2028 may election ang presidente at mga senators hindi pa yung lgus kong at senators na 2025 na ele kasi three, three years pa lang. So, presidente at senators yung uh, five years kasi sila. So, hindi pa sila magra-run sa 2028. Tapos, ang sunod nila na run 2030, LGUs and Kongs. Hindi ang mga senador. Ay, hindi ang presidente. Di ba? Tapos, ang sunod 2031, 12 senators only. Ang tatakbo. Wala talagang Ang presidente, walang senador, walang LGUs, walang cooks. Dose lang yan kasi sila ang na-elect noong 2028 ng mga senador. Tapos another election in 2033. Presidente lang ang elect mo dito. Kasi na-elect siya noong 2020, sorry, 2028 siya na-elect. So may five years siya, 2033 election na naman. Presidente lang. Wala nang iba. And then 2034 election na naman, 12 senator. of holding such elections not to mention the public funds we're going to, to spend for these elections uh, next slide please uh, ito naman please allow me to discuss lang a certain points here no? para sa akin yung mga provision to allow aliens to explore and utilize our natural resources para sa akin very dangerous po yan Mr. Chair kasi hahayaan natin as sources natin, West Philippine Sea, tayo yung mga anak natin at mga apo natin yung ano yan. Siyempre, ako, counsel ng bayan muna, when we filed the petition in the Supreme Court to declare as unconstitutional the joint marine seismic undertaking, between China and, and the Philippines. During congressional hearings here, I, I, I was here and I asked the DFA and the executive, ano bang nahita natin doon sa joint exploration sa China? Or 
early resolution ang na-file ko sa Korte Suprema since 2008 until, of course, nanalo kami noong 2022. I'm glad na ipanalo namin yung kaso na yun. Uh, kahit mahaba, we're still happy. Pero mawawala po ng basis kami dyan. Ay, yung FDI, this obsession para sa akin po, ano, I mean, we, we have different kinds of uh, uh, position dito. FDI as our main road to development, hindi siya ang main, uh, hindi siya ang main uh, engine of growth. Are investments important? Yes, of course. But it should not be the main engine of growth. Para sa akin, Mr. Chair, ang engine of growth dapat is national industrialization. Buhos, kapita, buhos suporta ang gobyerno sa lokal na negosyo at industriya. That's what Korea did. That's what Taiwan did. Next slide, please. Kasi kung, kung titingnan no, Mr. Chair, ah, sorry, land mo na. Is land really decisive for investors? Hindi ako mag-invest I cannot own land. But no, no, none of them can own land in China or Vietnam. Yet, Both countries attract foreign investors also. So hindi ko maisip na ang lupa, crucial sa investor, kaya hayaan nating ibenta ito sa foreigners. And in fact, maraming bansa, Mr. Chair, nakaparel lang naman natin. Di ba? As yung basa ko lang naman, ang Thailand, bawal din. Ngayon, recently, residential land, pwede nang ibenta. Use of rock lang naman sa Indonesia. Ibig sabihin, you can use it, but not, you know, not own it. Iba yon. So, nung debate dati dito, hindi naman yan madala sa kanilang bansa, ang lupa, yeah, I agree. Pero ang, ang mga kayamanan natin, hindi naman natin madala sa langit. Ano, pamimigay ba natin yan? Hindi, di ba? Kasi you own it eh. So, sa, sa akin, selling of lands to foreigner is a concern of food security. Pag mag golf course na yan, eh, paano pa, sino pa magtatanim ng palay, sibuyas, does it not concern national security? Of course, yes. Pag binili ng China lahat ng beachheads dyan sa Mindoro at Palawan, national security problem natin yan, Mr. Chair. And of course, afford, affordable housing to ordinary Filipinos. I think my last two slides na lang, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, I was about to say that we have extended your time. Yes, thank you. Oh, just two slides. Thank you very much. Sige. Uh, dyan, okay na yan. Taiwan. Uh, tinignan ko. Yeah, but dyan, yung slide na yan, please. Y yung... Taiwan and Korea, kung tinignan yung kanilang FDI sa, yung sa taas, hindi nyo na ma malinaw, pero kung tingnan nyo sa taas, those are foreign uh, direct investments. Pag tingnan nyo, nang, luma nang lumakas ang Taiwan at Korea, mas malaki ang ating direct in foreign investment sa kanila. Kung titingnan mo, yung, lalo na nung implemented ang 1987 Constitution, tingnan yung 1990-94, 1.1 ang Pilipinas, 0.0 5% lang ang investments sa South Korea. 0.5% ng GDP nila. Oh, di ba, di, I, I, point, 0.7% si Taiwan. So, tingnan mo all the while, yung sa taas Pilipinas, mas malaki palagi ang percent ng GDP natin kaysa sa percent ng GDP nila. But, munlad naman sila. So, sa akin, yung... Of while I recognize that investments are important, hindi siya po ang yung nag-degenerate ng ano. Kung nag-industrialize si South Korea, gumawa siya ng Kia niya, gumawa siya ng Hyundai niya, suporta ang gobyerno doon. Yun ang nagpa-unlad sa kanya, hindi yung magpapa-invest ka dito. Lahat na lang ng presidente, Mr. Chair, lahat ng presidente mula pang pinanganak ako, pag lumabas sila ng bansa, pagbalik nila, I brought with me $100 million of investment, $200 million, $300 Siguro trillion trillion dollars na yung na-invest sa atin, mga tubang buhay natin. Hindi, Mr. Chair. So, I'll just go to the last slide, please. So, uh, ito lang, Mr. Chair lang. Comment ko lang dyan, sandali. Short lang yan. Bakit? Unless otherwise provided by law, the participation of foreign investors in the governing body of any public utility shall be limited to their proportionate share in its capital. Bakit may unless otherwise provided by law? Hindi ba tama lang naman, Mr. Chair? Pag foreigner ka, ikaw ang may-ari ng Meralco, kung anong share mo sa capital, yun ang share mo sa board. Why should we allow foreigners who have 30% 
equity o share in the capital, 80% of the board, hindi naman pwede yan. Dapat ang participation ng foreign investors in the governing body of any public utility shall be limited dapat lang to their proportionate share. Huwag naman natin silang hayaan na makopong yung buong board kahit maliit lang ang share nila sa capital. Last slide, please. Ay, yun, ang last slide ko is yung pagpapasalamat sa inyo sa pag-imbita at pakinig sa amin. At ulitin ko lang, ang korupsyon at kahirapan natin ay hindi nagmula sa konstitusyon. Kaya ang pag-amienda dito ay hindi solusyon. Maraming salamat po, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, our former colleague. Uh, very, very enlightening. Uh, your position is really something that uh, you know should be considered by this committee. So let's now proceed. Uh, yes. To uh, the next, the member of uh, the 2005 Constitutional Commission, our very good friend, Attorney Raul Lambino. Maraming uh, salamat po, uh, Chairperson Rufus Rodriguez. Magandang umaga po sa lahat po ng uh, member po ng Constitutional Amendments at saka sa pag-imbita po sa akin dito. Isang malaking karangalan po na makasama po ang uh, mga maestrado ng Korte Suprema na tinitingala po natin magmula po nung tayo po estudyante pa lamang po sa College of Law at naging reviewer ko po si Justice uh, Vivi Mendoza. Malaki po ang naging impluensya po sa akin ni Justice Mendoza para mag-focus po ako sa constitutional law and political law sa aking law practice. Ganon din po yung mga akda po ni uh, Justice Adolf Ascuna. Uh, magmula po, po nung siya ay naging membro ng uh, 1986 Constitutional Commission at lalong-lalo na po nung naging magistrado po siya ng Korte Suprema, maging ang kanyang opinion po sila ni Justice Mendoza, concurring opinion ba o sila yung ponente o kaya dissenting opinion, binabasa po natin yung mga yun at mala malaki po ang naging tulong at impluensya po sa akin sa pananaw ko po sa ating saligang batas. Nais nice ko pong sabihin na sumasang-ayon po ako doon sa mga nabanggit po ni Justice Mendoza, ni Justice Ascuna, doon po sa provision po ng Article 17 o yung tinatawag po nating uh, amendments to the Constitution o yung Constitution on Sovereignty na binanggit po niya uh, Justice Ascuna. Uh, Ilong pong nabanggit ni uh, Congressman uh, Eric Colmenares, kaibigan ko po siya ng matagal na magmula po nung marami ko kaming mga pinagkakaintindihan, marami rin po kaming hindi pagkakaintindihan, lalong-lalo na po kung ang pinag-uusapan po ay pagbabago ng saligang batas. Pero yung phrase po na unless otherwise provided by law or unless as authorized by law, kung basahin po natin ang ating saligang batas, hindi po ako nagkakamaligi ay mahigit 100 provisions po yung ating constitution na meron pong ganun na nakalagay magmula po sa Article uh, 2, yung Declaration of uh, Principles and State Policies, hanggang doon po sa Article 16 ng ating saligang batas. Napakarami po yan na makikita po ninyo. So ibig sabihin po niyan, pinagkatiwalaan po ng taong bayan, ang Kongreso ng Pilipinas, na pwede po nilang baguhin itong mga provision po ito ng ating saligang batas. Pero wala kang makikita sa Article 17 ng ganyang phrase na unless otherwise provided by law. Kasi nga po, yan ay provision po ng amendments or constituent of sovereignty. Hindi po ako eksperto sa ekonomiya, pero sa aking pag-iikot sa Pilipinas nung manakarang taon, at naging kasama ko po si uh, uh, Congressman uh, Rufus Rodriguez dito, yan po ang isa sa mga bagay na tinatalakay kung bakit masyadong restrictive yung economic provision ng Article 12 at saka mga ibang provision po ng 1987 Constitution, ako'y sumasangayon doon sa sinabi ni Justice Ascuna na siguro pagkatiwalaan natin ang Kongreso ng Pilipinas para pag-usapan po ang uh, pulisiya tungkol po sa ekonomiya, kinakailangan ba na batas ang uh, dapat ipasa ng Kongreso upang sa ganon mabigyan ng pagkakataon ang mga direct uh, foreign direct investments na papasok dito sa ating bansa. Sumasang-ayon po ako doon. Dahil halal naman po kayo ng taong bayan, pinagkatiwalaan po kayo ng taong bayan bilang kanilang kinatawan sa Kongreso, at sa ating mga senador din, ganun din po yon. So hindi ko po nakikita yung uh, isang uh, danger ng uh, 
pagbibigay ng kapangyarihan sa Kongreso ng Pilipinas dahil uh, sabi nga po natin, ang mga membro po ng Kongreso at sa Senado ay mga kagalang-galang naman po sila. Honorable members of the Senate and the House of Representatives. Hindi naman po siguro sila gagawa ng mga panukalang batas na hindi po tugma o taliwas sa kabutihan po ng bayan at ng mamamayang Pilipino. Pupunta po tayo sa pagbabago ng saligang batas. Meron po akong position paper, Mr. Chairman. May submit sa inyo po. Uh, sa mga nakaraang taon, marami nga pong naging attempts na baguhin ang ating saligang batas. Uh, hindi po ito naging successful. Isa po ako sa nagsulong ng People's Initiative noong 2006. Uh, at ang amin pong panukala noon, Mabago po yung Santiago versus Comelec decision, 1980s, 1997 Supreme Court decision po yan, na binanggit ng Korte Suprema doon sa Santiago ruling na hindi raw po kumpleto yung batas sa People's Initiative. Kaya hindi po naging successful yung PIRMA Initiative nung panahon ni Pangulong Ramos. Sa tingin po namin ay hindi tama yung naging decision ng Supreme Court na yun. Kaya kami dumulog sa Korte Suprema nung 2006. Yun lamang po yung isyo na aming gustong talakayin ng Supreme Court. Pero ang nangyari po doon sa aking final na petition, kasama ko po yung late governor uh, umintado ng uh, Bohol, ay tinalakay na rin po ng Korte Suprema yung isyo ng amendment ba o revision yung uh, panukala ni Attorney Lambino. Maliban po doon sa isyo na amin pong hinihingi noon na kumpleto naman po yung batas ng People's Initiative para baguhin ang Constitution, ang Supreme Court po ay nilagpasan po nila yung issue na yon at tumungo po sila doon sa issue ng amendment or revision. Doon po sa issue ng amendment or revision yung aking panukala na baguhin ang saligang batas upang ganun ay magkaroon tayo ng parliamentary system of government. Natalo po kami sa Korte Suprema. 8-7 po ang boto po roon. Justice Ascuna po ay isa po sa uh, member po ng Korte Suprema at bumoto po siya doon sa walo. Kaya po natalo kami doon sa issue ng amendment or revision. Pero doon sa issue po na kumpleto ba yung batas at nag-file po ako ng motion for reconsideration po dyan, niresolva po yan ng Korte Suprema. At doon po sa resolution ng Korte Suprema, sinabi po ng Korte Suprema, 10-5 ang naging boto po roon. Kumpleto po yung batas ng People's Initiative para baguhin ang saligang batas. Dahil po dyan, sa naging ruling ng Supreme Court na wala po yan sa Supreme Court reports annotated, yung po ang nakakasama ng loob dahil yung mga nakakabasa pong mga estudyante at mga professor po ng batas, hindi na po nila tinignan yung resulta ng uh, motion for reconsideration para sa kalaman po ng lahat, meron pong decision ng Korte Suprema at 10-5 at sinabi, kompleto yung batas na yan. So pwede pong magkaroon ng constitutional amendment through People's Initiative. At kaugnay po yan, naglabas po ang Commission on Election ng kanilang Rules and Regulation noong January 2, 2007. Andi dyan po yan sa COMELEC. Kung papaano po yung sistema o procedure ng People's Initiative para baguhin po ang ating saligang batas. Punta po tayo dito sa mga panukala ng uh, iba't ibang uh, grupo po kasama na po ang kapatiran na baguhin po ang saligang batas. Sumasangayon po ako na kailangan na pong baguhin ang saligang batas. Ano po ang maaring mode ng pagbabago? Dahil po major revision po ang gagawin po natin kung atin pong babaguhin yung ating saligang batas ay kailangan po na constituent assembly o kaya constitutional convention ang ating uh, gagawing mode ng pagbabago. Paano po ang butuhan? Nabanggit na po ni Justice Mendoza at ni Justice Ascuna. Non-legislative power po ang constituent power to change the constitution. Pero pagdating po sa voting, ay kailangan po voting separately. Dahil hindi naman po pwedeng pagsamahin mo yung Kongreso at saka Senado tapos the total number of members, doon mo kukunin yung three-fourths o kaya ay two-thirds. Kung two-thirds po ay para po mag-propose ng constitutional convention. Pero three-fourths para po, diretso na po yung constituent uh, assembly na baguhin ang ating saligang batas. 
Ano po yung mga panukala po natin na pwede pong uh, i-consider po ng committee at further discussion pa po sa ating mga uh, taong bayan? Uh, ako po, sinasabi ko na po ngayon. Naniniwala po ako na mas maganda po sana na magkaroon tayo ng parliamentary federal system of government. Pero ako re realist naman po ako, medyo mahirap pong gawin sa ngayon po yan. Kailangan pa ng mas masusing pag-aaral. Pero kung gusto po natin talaga magkaroon ng tunay na restructuring ng ating gobyerno, maliban po sa economic restructuring, magkaroon din po tayo ng political restructuring. Sinabi po ni Congressman Gastang Bunting sa kanyang panukala na kailangan po na laging magkasama yung presidente at saka vice presidente. A vote for the president shall also be a vote for the vice president. At yung term of office po, ng ating Pangulo na six years, tama na po yun, pero bigyan po natin ng pagkakataon ang isang magaling na presidente na marielek siya for another six-year term. Uh, kung hindi naman po siya talaga magaling, di, hindi siya marireelect. Huwag na nating bawasan na gawin nating five years or four years. Imintin na po natin yung six years, pero bigyan natin siya ng chance na talagang siya ay naging magaling at magkakaroon siya ng re-election. Yun din po ay magpapatuloy po yung kanyang magandang pulisiya. Ganon din po yung vice president. Pagdating po sa mga ibang uh, uh, officials, senador, congressman, local officials, tanggalin na po natin yung term limits na yan. Na three term limits lang. Masyado pong maiksi po yun, yung nine years na yan. Tapos ang papalit naman po sa kanila, yung asawa, anak, kapatid, hindi po na-address yung tunay na issue na bigyan ng pagkakataon yung mga ibang tao. So ang tingin ko po, katulad po sa Amerika, sinabi po ni Congressman Colmenares na two years lang naman yung term of office ng mga congressman. Tama po yun. Three years naman po yung mga terms of office ng members of parliament sa Australia, New Zealand. Tama po yun. Pero wala pong term limits. Dere-derecho po sila, pwede po sila ma-re-elect ng ma-re-elect. Yung mga senador po sa Amerika, six years din po yung kanilang term. Wala pong term limits. Kaya po yung mga senador ng Amerika, pwede na po na silang naging senador ng 30 years at maganda po yung naging patakaran ng kanilang political departments. Sa akin pong palagay naman, pumunta po tayo sa mga senador. Hindi po tugma ang sa aking paniniwala na pangkalahatan yung eleksyon ng mga senador. Wala silang nire-representa constituency. Sa Amerika po, yung mga senador ay by state. Dalawang senador, bawat state, kahit na po maliit na state yan, katulad ng Vermont, Rhode Island, dalawang senador. Sa California, na napakalaki o sa New York, dalawa pa rin senador. Yan ang tinatawag nilang equal representation in the Senate. Sa akin pong proposal, gayahin po natin, hindi naman diretsyo ang gagayahin natin, yung Jones Law of 1916 o yung Philippine Autonomy Act of 1916. Meron po tayong insular government na tinayo ng Amerika noong 1902 hanggang po naging commonwealth tayo noong 1935. Pero noong John's Law of 1916 para po tayo ay magkaroon ng preparation maging independent state, ginawa po natin yan, nagkaroon ng 12 senatorial districts ang Pilipinas. 24 senators po, dalawa bawat isang senatorial district. Ilang bang populasyon ng Pilipinas noong mga panahon na yun, noong 2016? Kulang pong 10 milyon. Noong 2020, ang uh, population po ng Pilipinas, 10 milyon, pero 24 po yung senador po natin noon. Ngayon po, 110 milyon na po yung 2020 census. 24 pa rin yung senators natin, elected at large. Sa amin pong uh, panukala po, suggestion lang naman po ito na pwede po niyong i-consider, ang Pilipinas po ay magkakaroon ng walong senatorial regions. Tatlo po sa Luzon, North Luzon, National Capital Region, South Luzon. Sa Visayas po dalawa, East Visayas, West Visayas. Sa Mindanao po, East Mindanao, West Mindanao, tapos Barm. So magiging walo po yung senatorial regions. Dagdagan po natin yung numero ng mga senador. Anim po bawat regions. Kung walo po yung senatorial regions, magiging 48 po na senador at elected sila by region. Sa tingin po natin, magiging mas responsive and responsible po yung mga senador kasi po yung kanilang mga gagawing mga panukalang batas sa Senado po ay tutugon po sa pangangailangan ng kanilang constituent regions. Doon po sa uh, party list natin ngayon, 
Huwag po natin i-abolish yung party list system. Tuloy po natin yan. Pero baguhin po natin yung sistema ng paghalal ng mga party list representatives. Tignan po natin yung model na ginawa po sa Germany, sa Israel. Talaga pong totoong political party list system po yun. Ibig pong sabihin yan, yung pong mga political parties na registered political parties, sila po ay lalahok sa congressional election kung ilan po yung legislative districts, kung ilan po yung mahahalal na mga legislative district congressmen, yung percentage po niyan ay maglalagay din po sila ng kanilang party list representative. Kaya po yung mga marginalized sector, security guard, labor, construction worker, kung ano't ano pa man dyan, ay masasama na po sila doon sa party list ng mga political parties. Yan po ang nakikita po namin na pwede pong idagdag na pagbabago ng ating saligang batas sa political restructuring, political re-engineering, kasabay po ng panukala po ng marami na baguhin po yung restrictive economic provision po ng ating saligang batas. Maraming salamat po. Thank you. Thank you very much, Banyero. So uh, for our last speaker, but not the least, we will hear from uh, Phil Consa, uh, the Vice President for Luzon, Attorney uh, Dona Dionisio Donato uh, Garciano. After his, uh, 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 after his uh, opinion on the questions, we will already serve lunch for all. This will be a working lunch. So therefore, uh, our representatives both present here physically and those uh, on Zoom may now register and to preside over the open forum with our representatives will be senior uh, senior vice chairperson of this committee and uh, Nonoy Defensor. So, Attorney Garciano, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before that, yeah. yes, an acknowledgement. Yes. Uh, also with us today is the Honorable Representative from the 2nd District of Laguna, Representative Ruth Mariano Hernandez. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the invitation to the Philippine Constitution Association. It is also, uh, I'm also privileged and glad to meet in person yes. uh, uh, colleagues of my father-in-law in the 1971 Constitutional Convention, uh, Justice Asguna. I am, by the way, the uh, son-in-law of former delegate and congressman Dean Quintos of Occidental mm -hmm. Mindoro. And uh, also equally to have met face-to-face uh, -face, uh, Congressman uh, Marcoleta. You, you were number one in my senatorial list, but wow. unfortunately you did not run. So I was so disappointed to have not been <laughs> to have not voted for you, sir. And uh, of course, special mention to my fraternity brother, Congressman Rod Gutierrez from the Aquila Legis fraternity. Your Honor, we are here this morning, particularly to look at the fundamental law, and uh, that is the Constitution, Your Honor, Mr. Chairman. The Constitution is fundamental. It is a fundamental law. Legislation coming out from Congress, which starts from the House of Representatives or with the Senate of the Philippines, would always cater to the fact that legislation should be based on the fundamental law. Because if there is a defect on the fundamental law, there would be defect in legislation. And eventually, there will be a serious problems in execution. You know, we must also give good intentions to uh, or give it, or give the benefit of the doubt to good intentions. We must give uh, this committee the benefit of the doubt that in proposing amendments to the 1987 Constitution, this initiative is with is made with good intentions. We should do away with the uh, notions of paranoia that, it, that this is being made to perpetrate certain people in power, extensions and term limits, advantages or taking advantage of the form of government. This is not the way to start. It's not uh, paranoia and bad faith is not the way to start in proposing amendments to the fundamental law, Mr. Chairman. 
which is the basis of all legislations. This committee must also determine as to whether or not the Constitution is a living organism or a strictly legal document. Is it a living organism? Because if it's a living organism, then the Constitution may be written broadly. But if it is a strictly legal document, then the Constitution must be written in a concise manner, complete and correct. As Justice Antonin Scalia said, of the, of the late Justice Antonin Scalia said, uh, 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 when he was uh, a member of the U.S. Supreme Court, he said that the Constitution is not a living organism. It's a legal document, and it says what it says, and doesn't say what it doesn't say. So, we must proceed from the fact on determining the character itself of this fundamental law. Is this fundamental law a living organism? Or is it a plainly legal document? Maybe this is the uh, guiding principles or the guiding the guidance that the committee must have in determining as to whether or not the Constitution should be interpreted in the, uh, as a legal document or as a living organism. So it is on this basis, Your Honor, that the Field Council will look on in submitting its position paper two proposals that have been already made by two constitutional commission, uh, two consultative committees, no? The 2005 Consultative Committee then created by President Arroyo, chaired by, uh, uh, I believe, uh, uh, Professor Pepe Abueva, and the uh, the uh, proposals made by the Constitutional, by the uh, Consultative Commission chaired by Chief Justice Puno. Um, there are certain provisions in the 2005 proposals made by... Uh, at, uh, in the 2005 uh, proposed constitutional proposals, then headed by uh, Professor Pepe Abueva, uh, particularly introduced or uh, proposing a parliamentary form of government, wherein the head of state and the head of government were separated, the prime minister and the president. Uh, which, uh, what is more peculiar about the uh, the uh, proposal is that the, of course, the press, the prime minister would be the head of government. And the president would be the head of the state and commander in chief. So maybe that answers one of the statements of the uh, of the previous resource person that there is uh, an enormous concentration of power on the on the part of our chief executive. As a matter of fact, there is a statement wherein our president, our chief executive, is maybe the most powerful president in the world because um, uh, he, we are, we are practically electing a king every six years, Your Honor, yeah, Mr. Chairman. So that is uh, how the uh, powers of the enormous powers of the executive has been described uh, as being like of a king. Okay. So there are uh, also provisions that uh, were proposed there, like for example, um, changing the uh, judicial and bar council to the commission and appointments in the appointments of members in the judiciary, the redefinition of the national territory, which uh, will add the phrase uh, 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 historic right by legal title, because that is not part of the uh, current constitution. We uh, notice that the phrase historic, historic right by legal title was uh, removed from the definition of national territory in the 1987 constitution. Um, also, Your Honor, uh, we also reviewed the preamble because it is in the preamble where everything starts. The spirit of this fundamental law starts from the preamble. Uh, in the preamble, Almighty God was mentioned as against uh, divine providence. So there must be there must be a determination as to whether or not to retain Almighty God and, of course, uh, or to change it with divine providence. So this is on, uh, on this basis, uh, Your Honor. Uh, the Phil Consa will uh, submit a position paper outlining all of these comments that I have made this morning. Thank you very much, Your uh, Thank you very much, Attorney Garciano. Thank you very much. You mentioned about Scotus Associate Justice uh, Antonin Escalia, the foremost authority 
on uh, positive Islam in the United States. And uh, as against the rationalist view or the realist view, and to Antonin Scalia, what is the positive view is that what is written in the law is there. There is no more intention, no rationale. What is there in the law, written in the law, printed the law, is the law. So that is the, uh, the, the point. So other, others, other justices would go, let us go to the intention of Congress, the intention of the authors, and so forth. Uh, Scalia does not believe in that. But the, also the other point is Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, a realist, realist views that the law is just really what the justices say it is. You see, so whatever law you have, it's still the justices, uh, based on their experience, based on their wives' uh, you know uh, comments and the community and the Rotary Club. Uh, according to Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, realist. The law is nothing but what the judges say it is. So thank you for mentioning. It gives me a remembrance of uh, this particular schools of law. Thank you very much. So with that, we are going to now uh, I have to uh, uh, acknowledge a very good friend of mine who just arrived and who was uh, one of the authors of the bill. His expiratory uh, uh, note His has been already approved as the sponsorship speech, but uh, I'd like to hear uh, our chairman, uh, Benny Abante, if you want to add more to uh, your expertise, no. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I filed the bill, House Bill 6698, an act constituting a constitutional convention to amend the 97 Philippine Constitution defining qualifications for his delegates appropriating thereof. Uh, I feel that uh, if we are going to change the Constitution, it must be through a constitutional convention so that uh, the Filipino people will be able to elect whoever would be a delegate of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, which is more uh, perhaps uh, proper and fair. Oh, uh, I've always been uh, a uh, supporter of charter change, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Always been, because I believe that uh, the Constitution should be changed. I believe that very well, you know. I think that uh, our the 97 Constitution is a more of a vengeful Constitution than a Constitution that actually uh, uh, would be for the Filipino people. All right, it is a Constitution that was designed uh, uh, against the former president, rather designed to help the Filipino people. That would be my view on that. You see. And then, of course, secondly speaking, the NSAB Constitution was done by uh, hand-picked delegates by the president, not by the people. I think that it should be the people that ought to uh, elect the constitutional uh, delegates of the Constitution, not hand-picked by a president. Uh, I overheard something said about uh, uh, the Philippine president being the most powerful president in the world. Well, you know, that would be the case if the president would handpick the delegates of the constitution. This time, we would like to change that. This time, we would like the Filipino people to be the one to elect the delegates to the constitution to the convention, so that uh, we are going to have a constitution that would be uh, that would be able to really be the representation of the Filipino people. You lang pong akin for a while, then later on I would be able to discuss more things to you. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you very much, Chairman Benny Abante. So now I would like to therefore uh, uh, recognize to preside over. The discussions this morning to our senior vice uh, chairperson of the committee on constitutional amendments 
Congressman, Vice Chair, uh, Nonoy Defensor. Thank you, Chairman. To start our interpolation of the resource speakers, may I recognize the Honorable Deputy Majority Leader, Attorney Wilter Palma. Sir, you have the floor. Five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, to our esteemed colleagues, our resource persons, uh, good afternoon. I was listening to the discussion and all of my queries were already discussed, particularly uh, whether or not we have to revise totally the constitution or just amend certain provisions. Number two, what would be the mode? Would it be con con? Would it be con us? Or would it be people's initiative? And uh, lastly, uh, what specific provisions in the Constitution that are we going to revise or to amend? These were already discussed. And uh, I don't want to labor the resource persons. That's why uh, I have nothing more to ask. And I value your inputs and insights. And on behalf of the committee, we would like to express our gratitude for your attendance and giving us all the insights that might uh, that we're going to use in the near future as we discuss the constitutional amendments. With that, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, DML Palma. Next, we have uh, Representative Raul Manuel of Kabataan Party List. You have five minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good day to my uh, fellow uh, legislators, uh, pati na rin sa ating mga resource persons. Uh, I will... Uh, I would like to go straight sa aking uh, ilang mga katanungan uh, on the matter of uh, term limits sa ating mga elected officials sa presidente, vice president, and uh, other positions in uh, government. Uh, nice kong uh, itanong lalo na po sa ating uh, mga naging bahagi ng 1986 Constitutional Commission kung bakit uh, merong uh, term limits na nakalagay sa ating konstitusyon. Ano ang uh, context? Uh, bakit nakalagay ito explicitly? At ano ang inyong uh, posisyon doon sa ilang mga mungkahi na tanggalin na ang term limits o magbigay ng puwang for extension sa termino ng mga elected officials? Your Honor, uh, the term limits in the Constitution are part of the social justice provisions of the Constitution. If you read uh, Section 1 of Article 13, it is, it is to try to, to address the social, economic, and political inequalities and by equitably diffusing wealth and political power for the common good. The, that is part of the social justice theme of the constitution, the term limits. Okay, uh, thank you. May, uh, may dadagdag din po ba si uh, uh, Justice Adolfo Ascuna? Uh, thank you. Uh, yung term limits po na linagay natin sa saligang batas ay uh, intended to uh, give chances to others to also uh, hold public office. Uh, and uh, it's really a limitation on uh, the democratic right of the people to choose their leaders. And as a limitation, it is an exception to the rule. That's why as a uh, magistrate of the Supreme Court, I've always considered my approach as to whether or not a proposition at issue is the rule or is the exception. If it is the exception, then it should be strictly construed. So since term limits are the exception in a democratic polity, any interpretation should be strictly construed. So in case of doubt, you should not uh, uphold term limits. You should uphold the right of the people to choose whoever they want. But uh, 
I, I still believe there should be term limits, at least for the highest offices. Maybe it's time to remove it in the lower offices. Thank you. Yan na. Uh, salamat po doon sa naging uh, mga tagon. Bilang isang uh, kabataang mababatas, ay uh, sincerely uh, gusto ko talagang uh, maaral yung context na ng ating kasalukuyang konstitusyon dahil uh, naniniwala po tayo na ito ay uh, hindi sum sumulpot lamang out of nowhere. Ito ay naging produkto ng uh, mga paganapan sa ating kasaysayan, lalo na uh, pinagdaanan ng mga Pilipino sa ilalim ng uh, diktadurya ng uh, dating Pangulong Ferdinand Marcos Sr. Kaya yun yung uh, iniinugan ng uh, 1987 Constitution natin. Uh, pangalawa po, uh, tungkol naman sa form of government, I've also heard the suggestions bagamat hindi pa ito explicitly na nakalagay sa mga nakasalang na resolution of both houses or uh, house bills. No? Yung pagbabago sa forma ng uh, amahalaan. Noong uh, tinatalakay ng 1986 Constitutional Commission, yung form of government natin, Meron din bang mga debate noon kung dapat ba presidential, dapat ba parliamentary yung form of government at bakit uh, nakapagpa siya na gawing presidential yung ating form of government. So again, this is addressed to uh, the members of the 1986 Constitutional Commission. Can I ask the Justice Ascuna to re reply, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The reason why we uh, ended up uh, proposing the presidential as against the parliamentary reform government, it was debated uh, with Father Bernas explaining to us the difference between the two forms. The reason why we propose presidential is because of our consultation with our people. Contrary to popular belief, the Constitutional Commission in fact, held consultations. We went all over the country before we sat down to work on the draft and asked different segments of our people what they preferred. And our feedback from the ground was that our people still wanted to choose their leader, the national leader, the president. They wanted to choose. They didn't want the legislature to choose the leader, which is the parliamentary. The Filipino people we consulted at that time wanted to choose the national leader. That's why presidential. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, one of the resource persons, uh, namely Attorney Mary Javier Colmenares, uh, seems to be uh, against any of uh, the proposals to change our constitution. Uh, although hindi naging bahagi ng presentation yung tungkol sa posibleng pagbabago sa form of government. So, I would like to pose the question na bukas po ba tayo na i-entertain yung uh, shift sa ating form of government? Two minutes, Representative Manuel. Sir, please respond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ang basic position ko talaga noon pa man, it's not the form of government that matters. Kay federal yan, kay parliamentary yan. Merong federal government na mayaman, Germany. Merong federal government na mahirap, Ethiopia. May parliamentary government na mayaman, developed, UK, England. May parliamentary form government na mahirap, Nepal, at iba pa. Merong presidential form of government na mayaman, US. May presidential form of government na mahirap. Pilipinas. So for me, it doesn't matter. That's why during the debates here, I was telling some of my colleagues, ako wala akong problema talaga sa form government. Resolvahin nyo ang uh, land reform, political dynasty, corruption. Resolvahin nyo. I, I would be very happy to, to do that. Ang emphasis sa form of government, Mr. Chair, is actually diluting the ano eh. The issue, eh. I, I met the previous uh, members who were telling us noon, pag mag, na, early days, pag mag-parliamentary tayo, ito ang solusyon, ito yung uunlad ng Pilipinas. 
Tapos later on nakita ko sila pag mag-federal tayo, ito yung solusyon. I mean, akin, never ako nagbigay ng posisyon kung which is better. Although I'm, you know, uh, sa akin may may mga limits ang power whether or not anumang form of government. So I I will I will not choose one form of government over the other para sa akin it's the substance not the form. Salamat Thank you po. Attorney Colmenares. Can we move on to the next interpolator? Uh, Mr. Last, uh, last question. Yeah. I think Mr. Chair uh, another useless person would like to add. Um, if you're starting from scratch then you have to take a look at how the, at the countries are. And, and most of the countries are really hybrid, uh, I think, when you see it. But when you already have a system, then I like I suggest you take a look at the literature on constitutional design. And that's why I gave in my talk, in my uh, comments, I gave at least, there are about 15 reasons. And I only gave four. Um, and it's in my talk, Your Honor, that uh, there is no literature that says one is greater than the other. But if you already have a functioning democratic system, then you must only be better to just review it for manifest errors and maybe uh, uh, refinements, but not to change the system. And uh, I'll give you a copy of my talk, Your Honor. Okay, uh, we would appreciate a copy of uh, the files mentioned. Mr. Thank Chair, you. may I request that Attorney Monsod give a copy to everyone here? Yes, we would like to request the Honorable Monsod if he can provide a copy to the committee. We would like we respectfully request, sir. If thank you. Uh, I'll give it to the uh, committee, Your Honor. Yes, thank you so uh, much, sir. Thank you. May I recognize the Honorable J.C. Abalos for his questions? Good morning po, Mr. Chair, and malaming salamat po. Good morning po as well to my honorable colleagues as well as to our resource persons. First of all, I would like to thank our resource persons for providing us their insights on the proposed measures that are being deliberated today. That being said, I would like to set forth uh, my observations when it comes to these measures as well as my insights as well from what have, what have we been discussing today? First, regarding the constitutional convention. In the event that um, a constitutional convention pushes through, I would like to ask our resource person persons, what would be the conduct of these elections? Because um, upon my perusal of these measures, they have been silent as to kung anong election laws po ang mag-govern tungkol dito. Magkakaroon po ba tayo? ng period of campaign, mag-govern po ba ang ating omnibus election code kung sakaling matuloy po ito. Pangalawa po, may tanong rin po ako tungkol ho sa qualifications. Um, pagtitingnan po natin ang mga panukalang batas, may, nakalagay po dito na magkakaroon ng isang tatakbo sa bawat legislative district. There are 253 legislative districts, if I'm not mistaken. And I would like to know kung meron po bang residency requirement because most not almost all of these provision, I mean measures, are silent as to that. In addition to that po, magkakaroon po ba tayo ng some sort of assurance that marginalized sectors will be properly represented because under the proposed um, bills, one per legislative district lang po. So I would like to know the recommendations of our resource persons if there's a possible way for us to assure that marginalized sectors of society would be represented in the event that a con con does push through. And finally, I would also like to know the consensus of our resource persons as to the age requirement. Kung sino po ang pwedeng sumali sa con, con Minsan nakasulat po, age 25. Minsan po, age 35. Um, ako po, since I am under the age of 35, gusto ko po sana age 25 para at least ma-represent rin po ang, kabata, ang mga kabataan natin sa paghulma ng bagong konstitusyon kung sakaling matutuloy po ito. At finally po, gusto ko po itanong sa ating mga resource person, ano po yung magiging amount ng per diem ng mga taong makikilaho sa constitutional convention? Minsan po kasi nakalagay 2,000, 5,000, and 10,000. We know that... Um, these things can become quite costly for us in the event that they push through. So uh, to wrap up po, yun lang naman po ang aking mga observations and I look forward po to hearing 
from our resource persons. Marami Thank you. Na. Thank you so much, Honorable Abalos. It would entirely depend on the law calling for a constitutional convention that uh, Congress and Senate will pass. But may I ask uh, Justice Ascuna, who was a constitutional convention member, to briefly address the uh, questions of the Honorable J.C. Abalos. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I uh, personally believe that uh, you should uh, look into the law that called for the election of the 1971 Constitutional Convention. That proved to be a model legislation. It uh, provided for a nonpartisan form of uh, election. And uh, it also uh, provided for a uh, mechanism by which uh, the election was considered one of the most peaceful at that time uh, uh, that was ever held in the Philippines. It can be improved by, uh, as uh, your honor suggested, uh, providing for the inclusion of marginalized sectors as uh, representatives in the eventual constitutional convention that will be chosen. And uh, I remember that in our time, the members of Congress were prohibited from uh, running for the as delegates to the Constitutional Convention, 1971. So uh, that's my suggestion, Mr. Chair. Uh, look into the law creating the the uh, calling for the 1971 Concon uh, delegate election. Thank you, yeah. Justice Ascuna. May I recognize Mr. Attorney Colmerale, Colmenares, sir? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, with regards to the assurance of uh, marginalized and underrepresented representatives of the party system, uh, we filed a petition in the court in the Supreme Court in 2000, precisely on that issue. In the case of Bayan Muna versus Comilec, wherein we said that the party system should be reserved for the marginalized and underrepresented, we won the petition. That was my first oral arguments before the Supreme Court, and. Uh, you know, in the end, it, there's a landmark decision penned by Justice Panganiban, which said that it should be reserved for the marginalized and, well, reserved, quote unquote, for the marginalized and underrepresented. It was, however, overturned by the case of Atong Paglaong versus Comilec. In, in 2013. So now there is that uh, has been more or less abandoned by the Supreme Court. There was a bill filed by Bayan Muna and I was one of the authors in those bills, that the party list system, the nominee specifically, should be, should be limited. That any nominee of the party list system with substantially more income than a district congressman cannot run. Any, any president, vice president, senator, congressman previously, nanalo na siya sa distrito, hindi na siya pwedeng tumakbo kasi the party list system is precisely for that. We argued during the oral arguments, I argued that there is an 80-20 difference in the Constitution. One is for the district and the other is the 20% for the party list. Kung papasalihin lang natin yung 80% sa 20%, eh ba't pa tayo naghati sa Constitution? But that's not the intention of the Constitution. The intention is to really segregate. In any case, that uh, part, the uh, bill... <laughs> Uh, that says disqualified la to be nominees, uh, ganyan, uh, failed to pass uh, the House and the Senate. But uh, th those are the efforts. And Thank I you. think uh, that was an issue that has been resolved several times with the Supreme Court and may be resolved again in the near future. Salamat po. Thank you, Attorney Colmenares. May I recognize uh, Chairman Monsod first, then uh, Attorney Lambino before we proceed to the next interpolator. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I think Attorney Lambino... Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, going back to the um, uh, question of uh, Congressman Abalos, how the um, delegates of the Constitutional Convention uh, would be elected. Uh, going back to the 1971 uh, Constitutional Convention, as mentioned by Justice Ascuna, there were two delegates per congressional district that were elected in 1971. In the proposal of Ang Kapatiran, there will just be one uh, delegate to be elected from the 253 current uh, legislative districts. 253 is still a huge number. Uh, in 
1971, I think there were more than 300 uh, delegates. And that was a big issue. San ba sila mag-hold ng kanilang uh, uh, session? Nag-umpisa po sila sa Quezon City Hall yata sila nag-umpisa noon eh. Kung hindi ako nagkakamali hanggang kung saan-saan na po sila napunta. Hanggang matapos po nila yung 1973 Constitution. So sabi nga po ni uh, Justice Mendoza sa presentation niya kanina, isang issue dyan is yung cost. Kung gawin po nating one per congressional district, ay 253 delegates yan. Magkakaroon ng staff yan, etc., researchers, etc. Malaki po yan. Pero yun po talaga ang presyo ng demokrasya. Eh. Expensive po talaga ang pagpatakbo ng isang demokrasya. So, kailangan pong uh, ito'y balikatin ng taong bayan kung gusto po natin talaga magkaroon ng tunay na pagbabago sa ating fundamental law na sinabi po ni Atty. Garcia. No? Ano? Uh, patungkol naman po doon sa forma. Pero tama po yung sabi ni Justice Kunan. Kailangan po talaga non-partisan po yung eleksyon ng, uh, ng mga delegado. Naalala ko medyo bata pa po ako noon, high school po ako noon. Nakita ko po yung mga kandidato po sa Constitutional Convention noong 1971. Sabay-sabay po silang nangangampanya sa isang uh, rally. Ando doon lahat. At uh, yun nga po, magsasalita po sila. Hindi po yung kanya-kanyang nag aos to na katulad ng ginagawa ng mga congressmen or mga local officials. They are given one day na mag-explain sila sa bawat bayan. At nahalal naman po yung mga magagaling na delegado. Siguro yun po magiging parang template po ng Commission on Election. Kung ano po yung qualification, age qualification, nasa kongreso na po yan ngayon. Kung uh, ano po yung ipapanukala po nilang batas yan, 25 ba yung uh, minimum? Kailangan pong walang maximum kasi marami pa pong magagaling na mga Pilipino na kahit ang edad po nila 95 or 100 na eh kung brilliant pa naman po yung kanilang pag-iisip ay qualified po silang maging delegado ng Constitutional Convention kung yan po yung magiging modo ng pagbabago ng saligang batas. Ang problema nga lang po dyan, katulad ng sinabi kanina ng mga resource persons is kakayanin ba ng kaban ng bayan ang isang Constitutional Convention? Sa akin po personally, kailangan kayanin po yan kasi yan po talaga ang presyo ng isang demokrasya. Mahal nga po, pero yun po ang tinatawag nating taxation through representation. Kasi ang taxation nga is, uh, ano yan, eh, confiscatory yan. Ayaw talagang magbayad ng mga tao ng kanilang buwis, pero persado silang nagbabayad. E bigyan naman po natin sila ng tamang representation Thank sa you. Constitutional Convention. Thank you, Thank you, Attorney Lambino. Chairman Monsod, sir? You're recognized. I, I just wanted to comment on the party list. Uh, the uh, decision of uh, Justice Carpio uh, is the correct decision on the party list. If you read the, the, uh, the, the record of the constitutional provision, party list is supposed to be proportional representation and not limited to marginally economic or po poor. It should include those underrepresented or marginalized political thinking or other doctrines. And rather than they do it through other means, we must open the door to listen to everything and to all, all uh, extreme left or extreme right. And these are people who cannot win in district elections. That's why it needed, they needed to have a national constituency. And that is why the, that's the party list. The reserved seats are only for the first three elections after uh, the law is passed. And after that, it's open. Uh, but the marginalized, it's, it's, it can be uh, regional, um, uh, marginalized poor, marginalized in ideology and so on. And there are studies to show that if this were uh, uh, this were done properly, uh, the quality of legislation and debates in the House improved. Now, earlier I suggested three amendments to the Constitution, so it's not abused. The first is put an anti-dynasty provision there because that's the first abuse. Number two, don't limit it to three. What happens now if, if a party is a party gets enough votes for, say, six, he gets only, it gets only three, and then the, the excess votes is allocated to people who may have no relation at all to the ideology of that who won. 
So he gets he gets a free seat, right? That's that's happened now. So leave it be. Don't put a limit on it. If they if the people want them and, and it's equivalent to six seats, give them six seats. Why limit to three? Uh, and third, that the, close the loophole on track record uh, track record of advocacy, because that is used by people in order to have representatives who do not belong to the to the uh, to the organization and the party list. With those three provisions, then you will go to the spirit and intent of the provision of the constitution uh, on party list. Thank you, Chairman Monsoon. Chair, Chair, yes. Can, can I just, uh, no, uh, be, while we're talking about the party list system. Yes, Chair Bante. Uh, I do not know, Attorney Monsoon, if you still believe that the party list right now is marginalized. So therefore, if you still believe that the party list system right now in Congress is marginalized, number one. Number two, how do you determine, how would you determine if the party list is marginalized? By opening it up. And, but uh, you see, also, uh, by the way, when you when you put a limit of three, there is an amoeba effect. For example, there is a party list of farmers. Instead of one national one national group of farmers, they divide it, you know, so that there are five or six of them because of the limit of three. And so, and so, what happens? You have 150 parties in the party list system. People get confused, and uh, there are what? How many? 28 million who voted party list out of what? 50 million who voted. Only 27 or 28 million voted in the party list system. And, and so, if we if we follow the correct mode of doing it and urge, for example, fishermen to coalesce because there is no more limit of three, then you will then you will have five representatives of five or six or seven or ten. Or urban poor, for example. That that's the point of the of the amendments. And today, it it's not really being properly implemented, according to the spirit and intent of the constitution. I, I'm one of the I'm one of the proposers of party list in the constitutional commission, Your Honor. Thank you, Chair Monson. Uh, yes. uh last two minutes, sir. Yeah, uh, to, to the questions of Honorable Avalos. Um, uh, Doon po sa pinropose naming uh, batas, uh, ay palagay, palagay ko ay nasasagot lahat ng inyong katanungan, mga qualifications, uh, anong mga uh, new rules na dapat uh, ilatag ng COMELEC in accordance with the election of delegates. And all of these, no. And uh, it's not. It's really very hard to 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 craft the law. No? Pero dahil sa uh, mga Google, Google natin, marami tayong nakikita ng basihan, no. Kung paano inilatag yung mga nakaraang batas. At nais namin banggitin na in so far as our proposition is concerned, that was uh, it was the 1971 uh, uh, law on the 71 con uh, convention that that uh, we we used as a template no? so sa aming palagay po uh, kumpleta yung batas na aming inilatag at doon naman po sa punto na binanggit ni ni attorney Lambino in terms of cost no kaya nga po dun sa batas na aming ipinanukala isinasabay po namin sa mga eleksyon yo yung pag halimbawa yung pag-elect ng delegate meron tayong dinidelay na barangay elections no if that can be december 2023 but di natin isabay doon yung election of delegates the the plebiscite isabay natin sa 2025 uh, uh midterm elections so kung meron kang pinag-iisipang gastos incremental lang yan sa mga ating gaganaping uh, mga eleksyon ngayon in 2019 midterm elections the budget of comelex was about i believe 16 billion no? in the 
recent 2022 presidential elections, the budget of COMELEC was 20 billion. Kahit ho, isipin niyo yung 20 billion sariling gagastusin natin para sa isang constitutional convention, hindi malaking pera yan. If we are investing for the future, for the next 50 years, for the next 100 years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cabrera. Uh, I have a question directly for Attorney Neri Colmenares. Sir? I have a question directly for Attorney Colmenares. On your earlier statement that the House and the Senate must convene before we can exercise our constituent power and be called a constituent assembly. May I know if, do you find the words constituent assembly anywhere in the 1987 constitution? No, Mr. Chair. Uh, the word, the phrase constituent assembly is found in Supreme Court decisions. Yes. And of course, in other jurisdictions, the way they describe the proposed amendment uh, to a constitution by Congress as a legislature. In saying that the House and the Senate must first convene together as one body before we can exercise our constituent power to amend the constitution, it deprives two separate houses of their inherent constituent right to propose amendments to the constitution. May I ask Justice Adolf Ascuna if my understanding of Article 6 in relation to Article 17 is correct, that both houses of Congress, House of Representatives and the Senate, have inherent constituent power to propose amendments to the Constitution separately instead of convening before they can exercise any proposal or constituent power. Mr. Chair, uh, in my opinion, you are correct. The word constituent assembly does not appear in the Constitution, much less in Article 17 of the Constitution on amending and revising the Constitution. It simply says Congress may, by a vote of three fourths of all its members, propose amendments or revisions to the Constitution. So, and Congress under Article 6 uh, consists of a Senate and a House of Representatives. So the Senate and or the House of Representatives uh, are the uh, members uh, that would uh, constitute uh, the Congress mentioned in Article 17. So I think there is no need to meet as a separate constituent assembly, but simply uh, act as Congress, but this time Congress acting under Article 17, proposing uh, uh, amendments or revisions. And in the decision of the Supreme Court, which uh, Attorney Lambino mentioned, uh, the Supreme Court decided that when Congress acts under Article 17, it's no longer acting as a mere legislative body That's under right. Article 6, but acting as a body that can propose amendments to the Constitution, which you might call it constituent body, doesn't have to be assembled together. Uh, but uh, acting as Congress, and Congress can have its own rules uh, on how to act, how to propose amendments to the Constitution. Its House, under the very Constitution, has the power to adopt its own rules. And so according to your own rules, if you can propose amendments separately, it's all right. You are not required to do it together. Thank you, Justice. So based on your opinion as a member of the Constitutional Convention, would it be correct to say that the House of Representatives can pass a measure proposing amendments to the 19, 1987 Constitution and the Senate separately by a vote of three fourths of all its members can also pass proposed amendments to the 1987 Convention and uh, they would meet in a body similar to a bicameral conference committee to present those proposed amendments for a referendum to the people for approval. Would that be a correct uh, guiding uh, procedure for us to follow? Uh, I believe so, Mr. Chair, provided that you signal 
to the people that you're acting under Article 17. Yes. Yes. To make it clear that you're not acting under Article 6. So usually this is done by a, a, a joint uh, resolution of both houses. Uh, you don't have to meet together, but uh, you'll be acting on the same resolution. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Justice Ascuna. Uh, may I wreck the Honorable Franz Castro for her interpolation? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. So, dalawa po, Mr. Chair, ano yung nagsabing na uh, it is not, uh, they, are, they are opposed to the um, charter change at this time. So, may mga sinabi rin po sila. Uh, yung, uh, kung natatandaan ko si Attorney Neri Colmenares at saka si ano, no, Attorney Christian Monsod. So, so, ang tanong ko po, ano, um, Dahil naniniwala naman kayo na there, uh, there are uh, loopholes in the 1987 Constitution. Tama po ba? 1987 Constitution has uh, many loopholes at meron din tayong dapat na i-amend. Um, am I right, Attorney Mary and Attorney Monson? Yes. Uh, yeah. I, yes. I, I thought uh, Justice Mendoza was also of that opinion, but in any <laughs> case... Uh, but that's just my thinking. That's just my thinking. Sorry. Yeah. Is there a need to amend the constitution in the sense that there should be constitutional yes, um, ang, 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 ang susunod na tanong, uh, what would be the right time? At ano po yung magiging tingin natin mga condition so that we can um, proceed with the changing of our constitution? Yes. Yeah. Well, I've never been against any constitutional reforms. I agree. There is uh, no rigid constitution that cannot be changed na di ba? Uh, but but for me the, the the current state of things does not uh, augur well for a constitutional reform uh, move. So the various contexts uh, mentioned kanina ni uh, Chairman uh, Monsod the, the context the content etc. So pareho kami doon in terms of context added pa yung uh, syempre Focus tayo dapat sa maraming problema ngayon. Uh, kagtatapos na ng, well, hindi pa nga tapos ang pandemic, ka, grabe yung inflation, and then magiging divisive po ang uh, ating uh, cha-cha at this time, uh, Mr. Chair. Kaya uh, in that sense, nag-forward uh, nag ako na not at this time, na hindi siya proper sa ngayon. And in fact, uh, the, the content itself para sa akin, lalo na, dangerous po siya para sa akin. So, yun yun po ang reason kung bakit ako. Kasi I disagree with the proposed, some of the proposed uh, provisions. And lastly, doon sa sinabi ko, let's not, ano naman, let's not raise it na parang pag hindi natin amyendahan, ganito ang mangyayari sa atin, lulugnit tayo sa kahirapan. Sinabi ko na kanina, na hindi naman yun ang... Konstitusyon nagmula ay itong ating nangyayari na walang security of tenure, walang land reform na genuine, may political dynasty, etc. Et so for those three reasons, uh, Mr. Chair, nagsasabi ako na hindi pa proper sa ngayong panahon ang pag-focus natin sa amyenda. In fact, dapat i-focus natin ang ating atensyon sa mga importanteng batas. At nabanggit din kanina ng ilang resource persons, ano bang batas na dapat unahin? Yung nabanggit ni Chairman Munsod, dynasty, reform ng party. Dito muna tayo. And of course, yung mga issues like security of tenure and the implementation of a genuine agrarian reform, etc., etc. Ang unahin natin kaysa sa mag-revert tayo sa constitutional change. Thank Salamat you, po. Attorney Colmenares. Mr. Chair, in relation to the question of Congresswoman Franz, uh, since uh, FBR's time in a reason, I mean, uh, hindi pa ang panahon. Since FBR's time. So, ang tanong ko sa'yo, kailan na panahon? Actually, salamat, Mr. Chair. Ang sabi sa akin dati ng mga kasamahan ko sa debate, nairi naman lahat ng cha-cha ina-against mo. Sabi ko naman, lahat kasi ng cha-cha kinakargahan nyo eh. Huwag niyong kargahan and we will be happy to reform the Constitution. Pag makita po ng taong bayan, may term extension na naman, you know, <laughs> medyo mahirap po natin i-argue sa tao. So actually, there are two sides here. We've been doing this for years now. 
one side keeps on proposing the same things through the years and the other side keeps on opposing that. So it's not actually a fault of the oppositors, but it's actually the lay of things. Kasi the, the others can also say, eh, matagal na na decision na ng taong bayan, ayaw nila niyan, uulitin na naman natin. So uulit yung debate po. So for me, yung ano lang naman dyan, siguro wala namang nag-argue dito that there's no need for such, kundi yung issue lang po ng uh, timing niya, content, context, as clearly described by Chairman Monson. Thank you. Uh, Franz, uh, Congresswoman Franz, uh, last, Mr. Chair, last two minutes. Uh, DML Palma, yes sir. Uh, in relation to the statement of uh, Attorney Colmenares, would the economic provision, uh, if we just tackle the economic provision, would your, uh, shall we say, bayan muna be supportive of the proposal? No, 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 Your Honor, uh, Mr. Chair. Kasi ang tingin namin, hindi dapat uh, pubuksan ang ekonomiya. Sa ngayon, at least. no. And of course, this uh, term ko kanina, obsession with FDIs, na importante naman, but hindi siya yung be-all pa. Yun yung reason ko kanina. So, and and lastly, yung sinabi ko na hindi naman dito nagmumula ang problema, etc. Salamat po. Chairman Monsod, can we hear from you, sir? Your Honor, um, no question of timeliness. Um, even when you shift to a federal system, you still have to enact laws on local government, uh, all, all, all uh, uh, social justice programs, and so on and so forth. Why don't you pass those first? And then let's see whether they work and won't need any more any change in the Constitution. I'll give you several examples. Just one. Just one. If you look at the history of the four tigers of Asia, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, and China, it says agriculture, agricultural development and agrarian reform, three, right? Uh, export, on export, and the, and the banking system must serve development goals. We don't have that law. Under our law, 25% uh, of the... Uh, of the uh, portfolio of banks must be in agriculture and agrarian reform. They never hit that, right? Because the law gave them a loophole. You can buy tea bills and that's compliance with the law. So now they said about four years ago, no, we're going to change that. We will penalize them. And at some point, uh, there was a figure of 10 or 11 billion that the banking system paid rather than open the doors and organize themselves to serve agriculture and rural areas. There are, there's recommendations on uh, amending the local government code that was the subject of a nationwide uh, consensus on what are needed to do it. Why not, for example, uh, put, uh, put, uh, create the laws because under, the, under the, the plan, when the farmers are given their land, uh, they're supposed to be given assistance on equity. Why? Because they are farmers and they're not entrepreneurs. They don't know where the market, they don't know transportation and so on. That was never done. The farmers were never given this initial capital to become entrepreneurs. And when, when we talk about roads and public works, uh, there was supposed to be a fund at the discretion of the Agrarian Reform Department to make sure that it reaches the rural areas, the poorest of the poor. It was that, that, uh, that fund under Aquino government was transferred to public works. So when they built, uh, when they built the world, it went this way, to touch, to touch the land development of influential people. So, you know, there are so many things you can do without shifting immediately on federalism or parliamentary system just to improve what we have now and not rush to change the constitution when you can do all kinds of legislation to make it work. Thank you, Chairman. May I recognize the Honorable Vivi Mendoza, sir, Justice? 
Kayo na po. Uh, sir, do you have something to add? I saw you raising your hand, sir. Uh, Justice? None? None. None. Can we move on to the next uh, interpolator? We have the Honorable Ace Barbers of Surigao. Sir, you are recognized. Uh, Mr. Chair, before uh, Congressman Barbers, I just would like to uh, uh, ask uh, Attorney Munsod. So, at this point in time, Attorney, there's no need to amend or revise the Constitution. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Thank you. The Honorable Barbers is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, um, gusto ko lamang po susugan yung uh, tanong uh, ni Congressman Manuel kanina tungkol dun sa uh, term limits. No? Uh, I'd like to take advantage of the fact that we have two esteemed members of the Constitutional Commission because uh, this question, uh, to my mind, is still left unanswered. Bakit po? Doon sa ating 1987 Constitution ay inalaw po natin na ang term ng isang senador ho ay six years and can be re-elected for another six years, which will be a total of 12 years. Samantala po sa Kongreso na three years ang isang term, eh, ang maximum lamang po ay tatlong terms, which is a total of nine years. Now, question. Uh, your honors, uh, does that mean the members of the House of Representatives is second class citizens? Bakit po hindi natin pinantay? What was the logical uh, conclusion or perhaps the reason why there was a distinction? Does that mean, kasi as far as we are concerned, we have the same job description. Walang magagawa ang Senado, walang batas mapapasa ang Senado kung hindi ho dadaan sa Kongreso at vice versa. Considering also, Mr. Chairman, that the most important piece of legislation passes or initiated in the House of Representatives, which is the national budget. So, what was the reason bakit ho hindi parehong 12 years? Uh, Justice Ascuna, would you like to answer that question, Justice? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. The, uh, there was no intent to discriminate uh, against the House. Uh, actually, the first thing we decided is Chris Monsod, who is the one who is the architect of this. He told us the first things we guys have to decide is how often should we hold elections? Not the terms. How often do you want elections to be held? You want it every year? Every two years, every three years, every four years, every five years, the frequency of elections determines the terms. Once you have decided that you hold elections every two years, then you can have terms of three years, six years, and so forth. So that's that's how we proceeded. So we ended up uh, having elections uh, that would give us terms of three and four, at uh, three years and six years, and then we went into term limits and uh, we decided to give three terms to members of the House and two terms to members of the Senate. So it ended up, as uh, your honor said, to be 12 years for the maximum uh, for senators and uh, only nine years maximum for members of the House. Uh, but. Uh, to equalize it would have been uh, four, four terms, and rather we thought that that's too long or too many terms. But uh, uh, there has to be a balance somewhere. And so uh, we struck the balance at three for the House, three times three, and two for the Senate, six times two. So that, that's what happened. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Ascuna. The Honorable Chairman Monsod is recognized. Since my name was mentioned, uh, Your Honor, we started with the President. Is it, should it be four plus four or six? Because uh, if it's four, usually on the third year, it's already campaigning to run. And which we, upon a vote, I think uh, we said it's better to have six without any re-election. If you notice, however, the vice president 
has a maximum of 12 under the constitution. And uh, of course, the senators have a maximum of uh, 12. <coughs> Sorry, yeah, time, time, times two. And the congressmen have nine and, and barangay officials and local have, have also nine. And it's correct that we, we tried to adjust the, the system so that there are on elections only every three years. But it is based on the term limits, which as I said earlier, is a social justice provision of the constitution. Thank you, Chairman Sod. Can we proceed to the next? Our last interpolator, may I recognize? Chair. Yes. I think the question of uh, the difference of work between Senate and Congress was not actually answered. Ano ba yung pagkakaiba ng trabaho ng Congress at saka ng, ng Congressman at saka ng Senator? Uh, that is, the, that is the, the gist of the question, more than the term limits. <laughs> Anyone yun, from yun trabaho ng senador eh, pag, may pagkakaiba sa trabaho ng ng congressman pare pareho lang naman ho yun actually, anyone from the members of the uh, uh, i think the functions of the house and the senate are not exactly the same sir in the sense that if i may mr chair in the sense that there are certain uh, house tasks and certain Senate tasks. So basically, pareho po, Mr. Chair, in the sense na legislative sila, etc. No? Legislature, conduct investigation, aid of legislation, oversight function. May kakaiba lang in the sense na, for example, yung, uh, yung, yung uh, ratification treaty, ng treaty. Treaty, treaty, concurrence in the ratification, sinado lang yan. Okay. Ang intindi ko, <laughs> sa budget talaga, dito talaga yan sa House. Magsisimula. So in those sense, different. Pero dahil galing din ako sa house, of course, uh, ayaw ko na ang house ay ma-ano naman, di ba? Ma-second class citizen siya. That's why for me, Mr. Chair, at uh, sa akin, yung, yung, ano, yung term, dapat hindi siya for one term, hindi siya tatakbo ang kongresista. Pag three consecutive ka na, wala ka na, hindi ka muna tatakbo, hintay ka ng isang term. Para sa akin, Mr. Chair, Dapat six years ang senador maghintay. Hindi yung half, half a term. Three years lang, takbo ulit. But for me, that is really a... Parang hindi naman tama yon para sa akin na may ganyan. Kasi the Constitution says, one term, hindi ka dapat tumakbo. But yung senator, hindi naman sila natapos ng one term. Pwede nang tumakbo after three years. And that for me even defeats the equalization of opportunities in the sense na Ang hirap na manalo na every three years, balik ng balik yung mga senador. So, the opinion ko lang po yan, Mr. Chair, uh, dito sa issue na to. Attorney Colmenares, does it, do you mean to say that you're amenable to amending the Constitution, including the terms and the re-election of senators? No, no, Mr. Chair. In fact, para sa akin, sundin ang Constitution. Yes, sir. The Constitution says, ang senador hindi pwedeng tumakbo ng more than twice mag one term muna siya and one term is six years. Nireinterpret nila ng one term is three years. So sa akin, sundin actually ang constitution rather than violate it Thank you. by that. Thank uh, you, attorney. Point. Thank uh, you. To expedite our proceedings. Mr. Chairman, uh, if I yes, just... Yes. Uh, uh, well, I do agree with uh, the explanation of uh, the our resource persons. But... Um, it seems that my query was not satisfied because uh, my question is, where is social justice in the ter number of years between a senator and a congressman? Now, now following the arguments of our resource persons, uh, perhaps they deemed it uh, uh, a balancing as uh, if I may quote uh, Attorney Monsod, a balancing act to be able to uh, prevent a an election every so of every uh, every other year. But again, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's the question is still hanging. You know, uh, 
equality, 12 years yung Senado, 9 years lang ang Kongreso. Uh, bakit ganun? So I just would like to leave it at that. And if the moment comes in the uh, amendment of the Constitution, perhaps we should consider that. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. you, Honorable Barbers. May I recognize uh, Congressman Ramon Rodrigo Gutierrez of One Rider Party List? our final interpolator before we proceed to the uh, guests on the economy. You're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good afternoon to all of us here today. Uh, before anything, can I just say that it is an honor to be with such legal luminaries to shed light on this primordial document, uh, which was crafted before I was even born. So truly an honor. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Mr. Chair, I will desist from asking the political questions of the whys and whens of the uh, proposed constitutional changes, as uh, this has already been discussed thoroughly by our uh, colleagues here today. But I do have a legal question that I would like to address, Mr. Chair, to the good justice, Ascuna. Uh, is, it, uh, is my understanding correct, uh, Mr. Chair, that uh, the suggestion is that we push through with the uh, joint resolution and have uh, separate voting three-fourths and then have this uh, scrutinized by the Supreme Court for a final uh, interpretation of uh, this provision? Mr. Chair? Justice Ascuna, would you like to reply, sir? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair. I believe that the procedure to follow should be uh, in accordance with the rules of its uh, chamber. Uh, I understand the Senate as well as the House of Representatives have adopted the uh, rules on uh, amending, proposing amendments or revisions to the Constitution. Uh, this is in accordance with the Constitution itself, which says, uh, remember I was the one who wrote Article 6, and we, I put it there that its house, its chamber, has the right to adopt its own rules of procedure. And pursuant to that rules of procedure uh, provision, I believe the Senate and the House has adopted a separate rule on how to amend, propose amendments. Meron kayo nun eh. Yun ang sundin ninyo. And if a joint resolution form is, is uh, allowed there, then. Uh, by all means, uh, make your proposal in the form of a joint resolution, joint with the Senate, para hindi magulo. Uh, like the proposed joint resolution number one on uh, removing the restrictive economic provisions that was pending in the former Congress. Uh, and it signals to the people that you are proposing to act under Article 17 and not exercising your legislative powers under Article 6, because you have to make a distinction. Although you are not uh, acting as a, uh, a constituent assembly as such, you are acting under Article 17. And to do that, you have to follow the rules of your own chamber on how to propose amendments or revisions to the Constitution. Thank you, and Justice. Thank you. Um, May I recognize the Chairman Monsod, sir? You would like to add something? I, I just want to answer the Honorable Congressman. Social justice, sir, is for the common good. It is not for the rich and the powerful. Uh, finally, we have um, the Honorable... Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, Chairman Abante. I'd like to oppose what uh, Ernie Monsod said. Social justice is for everyone, whatever the status might be. It is for everyone. I can debate with him for hours if I want. We'll reserve another session for that. Uh, Congressman Gutierrez, you have something to add, sir? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, sorry if I could bring the discussion. Uh, if if uh, we're done with that. Last line, two minutes. You know, last two minutes. I'd like to bring it back to the uh, question on the process that was uh, we were discussing with the good justice. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just want to zero in on uh, my question really is on the interpretation of the Supreme Court. Now, uh, because it was earlier mentioned that the Supreme Court would only step in after the we have voting on the three fourths, Pono. But I was uh, I wanted to ask the good justice through the honorable chairman: um, Can the Supreme Court 
act on it now because we are now uh, working on this in this very committee. We are now uh, deliberating on these proposals and uh, we already have the rules in place. Would this be ripe for adjudication or must we really go through the process and the Supreme Court will only step in after we have voted on the matter? Uh, that is my main question, Mr. Chair. Justice Ascuna. The Supreme Court will not yet act now. It's still premature. Uh, there's nothing justifiable because you might end up having no proposal. So there has to be an actual proposal approved by a vote of three-fourths of the Senate and three-fourths of the House. And if that happens, you are submitted to Comelec for a plebiscite. That's the time for the Supreme Court to come in. Mr. Chair, uh, that is all for my questions. Thank you very much. Last, Attorney, sir. Yes, in addition to the uh, answer of Justice Ascuna, as an exception maybe, as an exception to the Supreme Court taking cognizance of the case right now, even if it's not yet right, is if it is of transcendental importance. As I see it, there is no transcend transcendental importance right now, so the Supreme Court will not take cognizance. Thank you so much, Attorney. Our final interpolator, may I recognize the Honorable Jill Bongalon? You are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is just a follow-up question because a while ago, um, Attorney Coleman has already um, said that uh, he's not amenable for the amendment of the restrictive uh, economic provisions of the 1987 Constitution. May we know from other resource persons what are their take? comments or opinions, if we are going to uh, focus only on the amendments of the uh, restrictive economic provisions of our present constitution. Can we limit the resource persons to speak again on the matter? Can you address um, your question directly to one specific? Uh, I think Attorney Lambino is uh, willing to answer. Attorney question. Lambino is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, personally, if you are going to ask me, as mentioned by uh, Justice Ascuna a while ago, there are three parts of the Constitution. Constituent, the uh, Constitution of Liberty, which is the Bill of Rights. No? Constituent of um, Sovereignty, which is the Amendments. No? And um, the constitutional governments are the provisions pertaining to uh, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial departments. There is no such thing as constitution of the economy. And in fact, this is the only constitution in the world that has provision on the economy, which is supposed to be the province of the legislature and the executive, because they are the body that has the expertise. They, they, they are composed of experts, economists, financial managers, investment bankers. Hindi po yung kakayanin na maintindihan ng ordinaryong taong bayan. No? Nabanggit na rin po kanina yung pagbabago ng saligang batas ng 1935 Constitution. Noong una po, unicameral legislative body po yung sa 1935 Constitution. Wala pa pong limang taon, binago na po yung Constitution, bumalik po sa bicameral legislature. No? Tapos noong 1947, binago rin po yung Constitution, dinagdag po yung parity amendments para sa mga Amerikano. So, Nagkaroon ng pagbabago yung 1935 Constitution. In a span of uh, 12 years, ilang beses binago? 36 years na po itong Constitution ng 1987. Kailangan na po rin po siguro nating tignan na baguhin itong mga provision na ito. Kung ako pong tatanungin ninyo, completely scrap na lang po yung economic provision na yan. Tanggalin na po yan. Mas matutuwa po yung mga estudyante po ng political law. Thank, Thank you, Attorney Lambino. Chair Rufus will now conduct our afternoon session. Our resource persons are here. Thank you once again to our interpolators and our resource persons. Yes, uh, we would like to certainly thank the valuable uh, contributions, expertise of our eight uh, resource persons uh, today. And as a token of uh, my appreciation as chairman, I'm giving you a piece of, uh, you know, this is not about the Constitution. It's about seeing. So that we'll all see. You know, during the pandemic, I did not anymore revise my law books because I wanted to use a song hits. It's entitled Songs Down Memory Lane. You know, 20 years ago, I was able to get the CD from America, the top billboard of America since 1955. And I realized from these top songs of America 100, not the top 100, these are the singles. 
Billboard 100 gets the top sales in America from 55 up to the 90s. Now, I listen to all these songs, and of the 100 songs, 60% have become popular in, in here in uh, the Philippines. And so therefore, you are given now this particular songbook, Volume 1, AR, from A to L, uh, English songs from A Certain Smile, to A Day in the Life of the Fool, we all know these songs. Second volume is from M to Z. And in the second volume, starting with M, we have the MacArthur Spark by Richard Harris, the Knock the Knife. And then the last volume, Justice, is uh, volume three. Ah, uh, you will like this. Because volume three is, uh, uh, we have the uh, Spanish songs that we know. Amapola, Angostia, De Samibucho, oh, yun. And then Italian arias, Neson Dorma, of course. And then uh, uh, Habinera, Ana. And then, of course, we have the uh, Oh Solomio, my goodness. And then popular Italian songs. And then songs in Tagalog, okay. And then songs in Visayan and songs in the region and Christmas songs. So thank you so much for coming. You will have these three volumes from yours truly. So uh, thank you and start singing instead of discussing the Constitution, start singing at home. Thank you very much to all our research persons. Can we have a good picture of our resource persons here, right here with the seal? Uh, and the members be with us and the members too. Okay, our resource persons here and our comments here. Thank <laughs> you.